welcome here to St. Stephen's Church on Lansdowne for this informal service of worship. We're here on the northern slopes of Bath, just below the race course, up top of the hill and above the beautiful city centre. We're part of a benefice uh, with St. Mary's Childcombe, which is just down the lane, a place that Jane Austen used to like to walk and a place that's been home to uh, nuns and worship, all kinds of manners of sacred activities since about 350 or 360 AD. St. Stephen's is relatively modern in comparison to St. Mary's, but nevertheless, God's presence is steeped within these walls. And this presence and is here with us today as we worship wherever we find ourselves. My name is Andrew Akamenko and I'm the curate here and the priest for you all. It's great to be with you. We're deep in Lent at the moment, Palm Sunday and the remembering of Jesus's entrance into Jerusalem to begin his final week before the cross. Well, that's just a week away. Today is all about preparation. Jesus had completed his, and for our gospel reading, he declares that the hour of the Lord, so the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And whilst we're preparing ourselves to not only absorb the reality of what Jesus did for us, but to make that glory visible too. And we'll come to the message that has emerged out of the readings and prayers for this week but before we do let's pause for a moment notice the sounds around us notice how our body is feeling and settle into god's presence here with us with a prayer written for this week Lord of the new covenant, in Christ you draw all people to yourself. May we die with him to the powers of hate and let him show us a world loved by you through Jesus Christ, the fruitful grace. Well, our first reading comes from the book of Jeremiah deep in the heart of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. It's verses 31, sorry, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, and the link to this reading, the next, and everything else you might need for this service, you'll find in the description accompanying this video. So let's read the verses from Jeremiah. The days are coming, Surely, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, it will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it on my hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Our Gospel reading comes from the Gospel according to John. I often find that the way the church lectionary works is that it goes on a three-year cycle. Usually synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke are the main uh, Gospels that we draw upon. But when it comes to 
moments uh, such as Advent, Christmas, Lent and Easter we often draw upon the Gospel of John and John's Gospel is very much about making Jesus known to everyone. So let's read from John's Gospel now. It's John chapter 20, sorry I'll get this right this time hopefully, John chapter 12 verses 20 to 33. And this is just before the Passover, which if you've uh, been following our readings and uh, watching our online services, you'll know that Jesus is preparing to have his Last Supper. He's gathering like lots from around Israel, around Palestine, around the world into Jerusalem for this great pilgrimage feast. Now amongst those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now, my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now the judgment of this world, now the ruler of this world will be driven out. I, when I am lifted from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, we have heard from the Lord that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of the light. Let's take a moment as I prepare the word message. So, for hearing what God may wish to speak to each one of us, in the message, in the words that will come. So let's pray. Father God, may we glorify you today. May your glory be seen and heard in what I say. May the words be the words that you want me to speak. May the words that are heard be the words that you want to be heard, so that your glory is visible, audible, and known. We ask this in the name of your Son, born to save humanity and creation in its entirety. Amen. What gets your attention? Is it someone saying, hey, look at me? Perhaps it's someone who says, 
there's nothing on going on there's nothing going on here move along how long do such things tend to stay with you and have a lasting impact a flashy car a loud noise or a comedian caught in controversy may grab our attention for a short while but when a lack of substance is identified we tend to move on deliberate reverse psychology isn't that dissimilar our suspicion may make us look beneath the surface to work out what's really going on here. But again, we'll often see through it and move along. But when our interest is piqued by something or someone not attempting to attract our attention, whether it be through peace, through a peace, a contentment or wisdom that they exclude, ex exude even, the substance that we discover sustains our attention. So what piques your interest? What captures your curiosity and leaves your attention lingering and your thoughts thickening? Well, in our passage, it draws us to the fact that Jesus was more interested in substance than attention, at least not in receiving attention out of any narcissistic sense. There is a sense, suspicion of reverse psychology going on when Jesus told people not to tell things that he had done. He will have known, like we often, like we all do, that asking someone not to tell others something is often taken as an invitation to do quite the opposite. But the heart, uh, who he was and what he did, Jesus was interested in bringing people's attention to the substance of God rather than have people attend, put their attention focused on him. Jesus wanted the invisible character of God to make visible. That's the very definition of what is meant by the glory of God. The invisible character of God made visible. He wanted to, people to see know and live out the love and the life that we were and are meant to have. The very life we cannot live by rule of law or society, but by the rules for life that God longs to write into our heart. We see that across the Gospels. Before the turning point in John's Gospel, that was the reading that we heard, Jesus worked to make God's substance known through miracles, signs and wonders. It's why this first part of the Gospel is called the Book of Signs, in which Jesus declares that his hour has not yet come. He doesn't want the attention on him, but the attention to tune people to God's work in the miracles. But he reaches a point when things must change. As we heard in our passage today, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It's showtime. Episode 2 of John's Gospel has begun. The book of glory has started. Jesus is going to make the glory of God tangible and visible in and through him. John gave the visiting Greeks the role of being the key to unlock the next stage of Jesus' ministry. To fulfil the prophecies that they'd lived with for millennia. Not only would these visitors return home with news of what they had seen, but with them speaking the prominent language of the world at the time, the news that they brought with them would spread far and wide. God's glory was to be made visible in one country for all countries. People had seen the signs of God at work in and through Jesus. But to move these signs and the knowledge from their heads and hearts, to transform them, their communities and the world, they needed to make God's glory explicitly visible and accessible. Jesus knew that the time for things to change, the time, Jesus knew, sorry, that the time for things to change had come. His unjust crucifixion, death and resurrection and ascension would not only fulfil the prophecies that predicted how God would make things right 
between heaven and earth, but would make God's character, love, forgiveness, grace, would make those things visible and tangible to the world. God's glory indicated in the miracles Jesus performed would be known as an experiential level. People then and now would be and are invited to share in the experience and the glory that makes God's character known within themselves and within their communities. So where are you being called to be right now? Living in the subtle, subtle yet spectacular time of signs and wonders drawing people's attention away from you and to God? Or living in the hour of you showing the glory of God to others? The truth is, you exist in both. Like Jesus did before his hour had come, we're not called to seek attention for ourselves, but to let our deeds point towards God. So we're called to live out the attention-deflecting manner of Christ that piques people's curiosity and points them towards God. But we're also called to be ready to make our faith or experience with God known. Not a glamorised, ideal or fictional experience, but a real and honest one with substance to it. You can do that because you live with the glory of God within you. You may be needing a Greek locksmith to inquire and unlock that glory within you, but it's there. God gave that glory by making us all in his image. Jesus invited us to share in that glory in this passage and through his resurrection. And the Holy Spirit empowers that glory through connecting and communicating the love, wisdom and will of God to us in a way that is relevant to each one of us. I hope you have experienced the characteristics of God that is the glory of God. The God's glory is something Jesus longs for us all to know and experience with him and in him and with each other. But it's not something we can declare to be showing to people for such a declaration is, by its very nature, something that points not to God, but to ourselves. Instead, we should pray that people can see the signs that point towards God's grace and his love for everyone within our everyday being and doing. Whether we sense God's glory in and around ourselves strongly, dimly or not at all today. My hope, and I hope yours is too, is that we know, feel, see and experience God's love much more than we do now. More than that, that those who are not watching today will also see, experience and know the deep, unconditional, transformative love of the Creator too. Because knowing that love within our very being, within our soul, changes lives, changes communities, can change the world for the better. It frees us from the constraints of society that keep, all, keep people in the lanes dictated by the rich and the powerful few. It breaks down divisive barriers that keep us apart in the poverty of ignorance. And it opens up the possibilities of life as it was designed to be. Peace, harmony, contentment with ourselves and with each other. Indeed, with creation itself. How do we experience and live out God's bounding love for us and others in a way that stays on the right side of glorifying God and not ourselves? The passage from Jeremiah holds the key. Until Jesus came on the scene, God was present but concealed within the clouds and fire, earthquakes and storms, and the temples that very few had access to. The concealment made God difficult to experience, beyond knowledge passed from one mind to another. God was distant and detached from us. 
Jeremy's, Jeremiah's prophecy was that the knowledge of God wouldn't be written on slabs of stone separate from us, but written within us, on our heart, that God's glory would be experienced and truly known. Lent is the perfect time for you to experience God's glory, whether for the first time or not. To really know and experience God's glory, we need to let ourselves be drawn into Jesus' journey to the cross and beyond with any cynicism, scepticism and weariness set aside. In their place, we need to soften our hearts and open our minds and our vulnerabilities, at least to the possibility of the truth and the spirit that moves through the cross. I'm confident that if we do that, what might be seen with our eyes, heard with our ears and registered with our minds will be known in our heart, our soul and our actions. And when that happens, we won't have to make conscious efforts to make God's glory visible to others because they will be able to see it in our very being and be drawn to God, be drawn to know and share in God's loving glory too. Amen. Well, let's take a moment to reflect on what each one of us heard during that message. Let our thoughts mingle with God's in a moment of silence. We've come to a time of intercessory prayer now. Prayers that carry some of our desires for God to act, for us to be in tune with God's will too. So let's gather closer. response to the words Lord of Lent is renew our lives. Lord of Lent, renew our lives. Lord of Lent, come to your church and ask us the hard questions. Are we faithfully proclaiming your gospel? Are we demonstrating in our life together the justice of your kingdom? Have we welcomed the weak and given prominence to the poor? Install your glory into our ways of life, our structures and our priorities within your church. Create in us a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within us. Lord of Lent, renew our lives. Lord of Lent, 
come to the nations and challenge our idolatries. Sweep out the self-seeking pride, deceit, corruption and lies. May the kingdoms of this earth seek justice, peace and integrity of creation. May we look beyond immediate advantage to seek the common good and be drawn to it as a lark to the dawn. Lord of Lent, renew our lives. Lord of Lent, look with compassion on those whose minds are full of anxiety and bewilderment. We remember the people who are lonely, imprisoned, despairing and humiliated. Clear away from their more than necessary feelings of fear, guilt and self-hatred. Assure them that when you speak into our hearts and minds, we know what you are doing, for you have been there, one of us, and you are to be trusted. Lord of Lent, renew our lives. Lord of Lent, turn your healing love towards those who are sick and in pain today. We have in our hearts some known to us, some known to the church, and some only known to the news, through the news. Indeed, some only known to you. We bring them to mind now in the space of this silence. Clear away from them, we pray, those things that hurt, harm, and hinder them. May your healing touch still have its ancient power. Lord of Lent, renew our lives. For ourselves, Lord, we pray that your glory would be visible this Lent. Show us clearly those effortless sins we no longer even notice. Help us to address the sins which sit on our shoulder every day, our constant companions. Give us both discipline in dealing with some faults and gentleness in dealing with others, and help us to know the difference. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Lord of Lent, renew our lives. Renew our church, renew our world, renew our hearts, our cleansing Lord of Lent. Amen. And let us pray together the prayer God, God's Son Jesus gave us, in whichever language and version is dear to us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Father, what we have prayed for, answer. What we should have prayed for, remember. And what we regret, forgive. And what we are, bless. For Jesus' sake. Amen. been great to have worshipped you with you this week. I hope you have a blessed week ahead of you, that you know and show the glory of God in your lives. Let's end with a blessing from God. May God's blessing be yours, a blessing of loving kindness, a blessing of hope and courage, a blessing of listening and love. 
and the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer and Comforter, be yours this day and always. Amen. Take care of yourself, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.